Well, good morning, everybody. We'll go ahead and get started with our inventory fiscal year end review. And what we're gonna go through today is I have a presentation um, and we also have the closing checklist. And so uh, we're gonna go through the redesign steps on how to close out for the fiscal year. Um, and so here in front of us is the actual uh, fiscal year review page where we have the USAS and payroll um, our fiscal year and materials. So below the USAS is where I included the inventory materials. So we just have the actual presentation materials and then we have the um, fiscal year and checklist. And so I will um, pull up the presentation and we'll get started. Okay, hoping everybody can see this okay and they can hear me okay. And so um, these are basically generic steps and um, obviously you guys can go in and make any changes you need to to accommodate your districts. And I just told you where all of the training material or all the fiscal year and materials are at and um, I've got the link here. And so, um, just a heads up, we are still working on some of the things that need to be done for fiscal year and for inventory. And in the slideshow, I have marked those with the um, JIRA issue and also um, the, uh, the actual release date um, that I'm aware of at this point. I know that they're still working on scheduling some. So um, it's anticipated that everything will be done. Um, and by the end of um, July, but um, I just wanted to give you guys that extra material so that in case you wanted to watch uh, those to your issues, you can. And feel free um, to ask any questions during this presentation or in the chat, and I will be watching that. So pre-closing steps. Obviously, um, districts should be finishing their current year processing. So if they have items on the pending file that are dated um, with an invoice date or receive date prior to June 30th of this year, they should be added to inventory for fiscal year 22. Um, if they have items on the pending file that um, are after that date, obviously they can stay on the pending file. And when they open fiscal year 23, they can start adding that information. Um, so it's no different than the way it was in classic, it behaves the same way. So if there is some big depreciation um, issues that um, depreciation has changed um, quite often that it is necessary, like a new inventory load or something like that that didn't update depreciation correctly. Um, and that would have probably happened in classic before they migrated. Um, if they need to go in and update those, they can by going into the items grid, selecting those items and run the depreciate. Now, I know we've had a request asking if there can be a check all box um, for doing depreciation. And that is something I believe we have a JIRA issue for that. But right now you would have to select those ones that you need to recalculate the depreciation on and select the depreciation button. Um, just a note here, as we always noted in classic, and I am going to get more information from the auditors on, is the recalculating of depreciation. Um, because it does affect um, the true depreciation history. And what I mean by that is let's say you have an asset that um, is $5,000 and it's depreciation life is five years, okay? So every year so far, it's been depreciating $1,000. Well, during the third year of depreciation, um, you added an additional acquisition onto that, thus increasing the original cost amount. You, you changed it from 5,000 to you know, 6,000 now. So from then on, your depreciation when you, is going to be a little bit higher because the original cost is higher now. So for those first couple of years, it was $1,000 every year. 
And now in the third year of life for that asset, it's now going to be uh, 1250 and, until, you know, the end of those five years. So, you know, the history has changed. So if you go in then and run depreciate, what it's going to look at is it's going to look at that $6,000 and say, this original cost is 6,000 divided by five years, and it's going to do a flat depreciation calculation. So it's not really, you know, the $1,000 the first two years and then the 1250. Now it's just a, a flat, I don't know, I would try to do my math, 1250 um, every year. And so I need to find out more from the auditors regarding this because I feel like this is becoming more of an issue um, now with migrations and finding out that um, a, lo a lot of the uh, life to date depreciation amounts weren't being calculated um, correctly in classic, meaning an appraisal load came in and whatever the life to date was on that spreadsheet got loaded in, whether it was right or not or um, invalid depreciation, uh, beginning depreciation dates were entered in, thus not could have caused the life to date to not be calculated correctly in classic all these years. So I feel like, you know, we, I have a email in already to AOS to talk about recalculating depreciation. And if that can be run like in classic, you know, you still have, you know, um, several districts, you know, that haven't migrated yet, can that be cleaned up if there's a problem? You know, if things have already been fully depreciated, that's not a problem. But for those items that, you know, you're still currently tracking depreciation on, you can run into some balancing issues and things like that. So um, I do have a message out to them. And so um, I know that the, our contact person was out of the office. So I'm hoping that she'll get back with me next week and we can look into you know, is there an issue or I know it's always said you have to run EIS DPR and classic with extreme caution because of losing this true depreciation history. And so we've made those same notations and the redesign documentation too on the depreciate button to say use this with, you know, extreme caution as well. But I want a little more as to why. And if so, you know, is it, you know, is it really um, a big concern? So that's the information I'm going to give, hopefully get back from the auditor's office. And when I do, then um, I'm definitely going to keep you guys um, informed of, of what I've learned from that. Um, but yeah, this whole note has always been, you know, to me, like, what does that mean exactly? I mean, what, I mean, I understand what it's doing, but how much of a concern is it? And I just feel like we get we need to get more information from AOS um, and then we can document things a little bit better. So if you guys have any questions with that, uh, let me know. But, um, you know, it's always, um, I didn't realize, you know, that there was a, you know, that big of an issue with these calculations not being um, correct or up to date. Um, in classic. And now that we're doing these migrations, we're seeing some of this. So um, getting that information from AOS will be helpful. So hopefully we'll hear something from them soon. Okay. So another pre-closing step is just making sure that um, the entity's capitalization threshold um, that items that meet that threshold are marked as capitalized. So this has always been like a pre-check in classic and we're making it a, you know, pre-check and redesign as well. So here's an example here. Um, I just have a screenshot of how you can go in and check that information. So um, this particular entity has a capitalization threshold and the way that I can find that out is by going into core fiscal years and in, the, in each fiscal year, it's going to show you their capitalization threshold, their dollar limit and life limit. Some of them just have a dollar limit. Some of them have both a dollar and a life. 
Um, and so in this particular example, this entity has a dollar threshold of 5,000 and a life expectancy of a year. So any items that meet or exceed that should be capitalized. So how do you check that? You can go into the items grid, make sure to add the capitalized column on the grid and then filter using their cap thresholds. So because it's you know, $5,000 or more or a year or more, my original cost is going to be greater than 4,999 to make that 5,000 or more. And same thing with life expectancy, greater than zero to meet that one year or, or higher. And so um, if I go in and obviously I'm looking at the active items and you know, I you know, do these filters here, the capitalized column should say true. So for those, and if it doesn't, then um, that's something that we need to look into further as to why it doesn't. Um, but that is one way of checking to make sure that what they have for their cap threshold, those items are being reported correctly as being capitalized assets. So those are the pre-closing steps. And if you look at um, the fiscal year and checklist that we have out there in the wiki, um, it's labeled underneath there. We kind of changed, we kind of changed things up a little bit and put pre-closing steps on there to kind of emulate what we're seeing in the payroll and USAS fiscal year and checklist as well. So now we're to the point where we're ready to close for the fiscal year in inventory. So making sure you know all assets have been entered and they need to go in and start running the recommended reports. So this is where we're gonna get into some detail on you know, the reports that are out there and what is still in development for fiscal year end. Okay. And so the first set of reports we're gonna talk about are the gap reports. So these are reports that can be run for those districts that have their gap flag checkmarked. So obviously if they uh, had their EIS gap flag set in classic, they're gonna migrate over still quote, on gap in inventory. And so um, that doesn't have to be set or anything like that. Um, we are making some enhancements to that gap uh, box in core configuration, and I'll talk about that here in the end. So that is something that um, should not just be turned on and off at a whim. That's something that should not be really touched, to be honest. It shouldn't have been in Classic either. Um, it should, it's more of a SysMan ITC staff uh, setting, and that's something that the districts can go in and change. Um, so, you know, we're looking into making some improvements on that and um, adding a few, maybe an, an extra enable disable button. Um, so I'll talk about that when we get to that point. Um, but in order to run the gap reports, that box needs to be checkmarked. So if they were on gap in classic, they migrate over on gap in redesign, they don't have to do anything, they can run the reports. So the first report that they're running is the fixed asset by source report. And um, you guys are probably really familiar with this report because that's all we've been doing is running balancing reports when we're doing the migration. And so um, this is the report that summarizes the original cost. This is the original cost amounts on capitalized assets by their source fund, by their um, the actual fund on the account that was used to purchase it. So the classic counterpart, I put in the classic counterparts on this for this year, just because it's so new. And I just want you know the districts to try to make sure they tie in fixed asset by source equals the EIS 101. So they kind of have that familiarity of what it was in, in classic. So like I said, the source means the fund the items were originally charged to when purchased. So it's using that purchase order information if that information was you know, added on the item and to identify that source fund. So it's looking at that account you know, when you create an item or when you do an additional acquisition transaction, you, know, you can pull from the pending file and it's got a, a section there to add the account code. 
um, that's the account that it was purchased from on the purchase order. And so that fund dimension is what we're talking about here. It's looking at that and pulling that in. And so um, the actual name of the report when you generate this is called fixed assets by source report.pdf. It's a mouthful. Um, so that's the name of the PDF file. So right now our reports in redesign are generating PDFs. Um, we don't have any other formats right now. I think we have a feedback issue to create different formats like spreadsheets and stuff like that. But for now, you know, we're giving them the same reports that they had in Classic. So the next report is the fixed asset by function and class. And that Classic counterpart is the 102. And so this is a schedule of fixed assets by function and class, and you can run it three different ways. And so for fiscal year end, it's recommended to generate the report in all three formats. So that's something that the EISCD did, um, and it's a and it's, um, better recommendation, I believe, from the auditor's um, office or from field auditors um, to have that report three different ways. So let's talk about these three different ways. The first one, is a schedule by function and class. So when you run the report, you'll be able to click on the report format type and there'll be a schedule by function and class. And this does just what it says. It's going to sort it by function and then within the function by the asset class of that function. And it's going to display the original cost and the book value. Now the book value is the original cost minus the total depreciation that equals the book value. Um, the schedule by class um, displays, it's just a report by class. So there's no function um, sorting in here. It's just the asset classes. And it's going to also include the original cost and the book value. And then the summary by function and class. Um, so you've got the schedule by function and class, and then you've got a summary by function and class, which is just that. It allows you to summarize it by a two digit function instead of all function um, codes. And you can report on the original cost or the book value. It's not going to display both. So those are the three different options available. Those are the same three options that were available in Classic. Um, so um, like I said, for fiscal year end, it's recommended to generate it all three formats, very quick report, boom, you know, knock out one, knock out another, um, very easy. Um, been doing that forever with balancing. So you guys are probably used to this. Um, the actual name of the report is again, fixed asset by function class report.pdf. So it doesn't change the name of the report by the format that you run. It's always gonna be the same report file name. So just a heads up on that. Okay, so we got halfway through the gap reports. The next one is the schedule of changed and fixed assets. And this is the EIS 103 report. So this is reporting the changes that have occurred in the capital assets during the current year. So it's a very fitting title. Um, in here, um, when you generate it, you've got a summary option and you have a detail option. So in classic, when you ran the 103, it generated both output files in the same run. So it generated the detail and the summary. In redesign, <clears throat> you're gonna have to run them separately. You'll generate a summary report, then go back in <clears throat> and generate the detail report. They're fast and easy, so not an issue. Um, for fiscal year end, um, they recommend that you generate the report by asset class, fund, and function. So when you go into the report, it's going to show you um, the asset class, the fund, and the function options. So if I just want to generate a schedule um, of change in fixed assets for by asset class, I would run it like that. I would select summary, and it will generate a summary report. I want to go back and run the detail report, then I just the, re the report options already up there. I just um, uncheck, I believe, the, the box, the summary box, and it will generate a detail report real fast. Um, and then I can do the same thing, change my uh, report type to fund, run the summary, run the detail, change it again, function, run the summary detail. 
So those are the ways that um, those can be generated for all three different types. So the summary report, and I have a screenshot, I'm gonna advance the slide here. The summary report, like I said, shows you the actual changes of what's going on. So I um, ran this by asset class. So it's showing me each asset class. And so it's showing me the description of that asset class. What was my beginning value? So it's looking at capitalized assets here. So it's looking at you know, what you know, meets the capitalization threshold. And it's showing those original cost amounts as they were at the beginning of the fiscal year by asset class. So if I went in and created an asset during this current fiscal year that meets the capitalization threshold, that original cost amount is going to be added in the acquisition column. If I disposed of any capitalized assets during the current year, then those original cost amounts are going to show in the disposition column. Same thing with transfers. If I transferred an asset, um, maybe the um, asset class from 0300 to an 0400, it's going to show the transfer in amount into the 0400, the positive, and it's going to um, show the transfer out. I transferred it out of the 0300 as a negative in my transfer out. Any adjustments that were made. Um, so this will include if you go in and you create an acquisition this year and it was really meant for a prior year and, you, and it's a capital and it meets the capitalization threshold, there is an option at the bottom when you add that acquisition, a checkbox for air, for air adjustments. When you check mark that, it's going to be reflected in the adjustments column. It wasn't actually an acquisition that was meant for this year. It really was something that we acquired last year. We just didn't get it into inventory in time. So I don't want it to show as a true acquisition in the current year. I want it to show as an adjustment. So by check marking that box on the acquisition, it's gonna show in the adjustments amount. Um, and that does happen, you know, they do, um, you know, forget to put something in there and they really don't want to show it that it was a true acquisition this year. They want it to show as an adjustment to that particular asset class. Another thing that can trigger adjustment amounts is the uh, running of the capitalization threshold. So those items that once were capitalized that are no longer, um, those will show up as well on the adjustments. So here's where the change book comes into place because it's beginning value plus what I acquired capitalized during the year, what I disposed of during the year, any transfer transactions I did um, plus or minus, any adjustments I made plus or minus to equal my ending balance. So that ending balance is what the you know, final result was throughout the year and where my current um, original cost balances are at by asset class, because that's how I uh, ran this report. So in these change schedules, you're going to see as well that it's gonna show you governmental, um, it's gonna break it out by type, governmental, proprietary, fiduciary are the three types. And there's that, then there is also an unknown type. It was like that in classic as well. And usually that's the result of like a missing fund or function or asset class um, that isn't on the item. So it doesn't know what to do. So it puts it in an unknown. So that was all explained in the pre-data extract steps that if, you know, they did see those unknown or undefined um, areas in the classic reports and they wanted to clean it up, it was optional, it isn't required. They wanted to clean it up, they could in classic before they migrated. But if they decided not to, that's fine. It'll migrate over in that unknown section on the reports in redesign as well. And if they wanna clean it up later in here, whenever they want, they can. So, um, so those, that's where those unknown fund types and or, yeah, unknown sections are all detailed in the pre-data extract steps. Um, so this top portion here 
is the summary schedule. And then, like I said, you would have to run the report again to get the detail. Now, the detail schedule of change is what makes up these amounts in the acquisition, disposition, transfer columns. So it's showing you what tags make up those amounts. So I just have a quick screenshot of the land and improvements. And here it was, you know, where is this acquisition amount coming from? It's coming from this tag. 9188Z was added during the current year. Obviously, it's over the capitalization threshold. And so that becomes um, part of the acquisitions that happen during the year. Um, so I, I kind of wanted to go through these in detail. I know some of you that you know probably are very comfortable with classic are probably yawning at this point, but for you know the new people that are just not really familiar with classic and want a kind of an explanation of um, these reports, I wanted to go in a little bit of detail. So I'm gonna back up a little bit. Um, and so basically, I just kind of explained those last two bullets is that, you know, the summary shows a summarized version of what's going on. The detail includes the tags that make up those amounts on the change portion of that. So if districts are wanting to balance um, their, their gap reports against one another, they can on the fixed asset by source, the fixed asset by function and class, and the schedule of change in fixed assets, because these all contain the original costs. So you should always, um, they should, you know, I'm, they probably did that in classic. So that's one way of balancing them against each other to make sure that um, those balance to one another. And what we did in redesign um, that we didn't do in classic, and it's always was kind of an annoyance to me, <laughs> was um, we made a grand total uh, row at the bottom of the gap reports. So that way you can easily check. It used to be that it just gave grand totals by the types, proprietary, fiduciary, governmental. And then you would have to look, you know, at the other report at the same fund types. I'm like, let's put in a grand total to make it a little bit easier. So there is a grand total at the bottom. So you can easily balance against one, one another here um, uh, for the original cost amounts. Okay, the schedule of changes and depreciation um, is the next gap report. And the classic counterpart for this one is the EIS 104. And so now we're switching over from original cost amounts to depreciation amounts. And so um, this is going to show you the changes in depreciation of those capitalized assets during the year. So the format looks very similar to the schedule of changes in fixed asset report, the 103 but it's the depreciation amounts, not the original costs. So again, you're gonna have the ability to generate separate summary and detail reports. And for fiscal year end, again, it's recommended to generate the report for all three types. And here's the name of the report, schedule of change and depreciation report. And I'm gonna advance one slide here just to show you again um, what these look like. And so um, again, I ran this report by asset class. And so you'll see that the beginning depreciation, so it's looking at all of those capitalized assets um, and the ones that obviously are tracking depreciation and it's showing you the beginning balance amount of you know, their basically their um, life to date depreciation. And then the continuing items is their fiscal to date depreciation. So, you know, if that's, you know, the system's calculating that on the fly and it's saying, you know, based on the original cost, the useful life, and that beginning depreciation date, um, this is what the continuing depreciation should be for all of those items that were um, added in a prior year that had been tracking depreciation. So, um, so that's continuing items is the fiscal to date depreciation. And then for any items that were added this current year, um, it's going to track the fiscal to date depreciation on those. So any items that were acquired, any items added, 
it's going to show the fiscal date depreciation on that. Uh, the disposed of assets, anything that was disposed of, any transfer in and transfer out amounts, we're going to show reflect on the depreciation on those, as well as that error adjustment. Uh, because in um, when you dispose of an asset, you do have the option to check the error adjustment flag. Those will show up there and to give you your ending balance. So again, same type of situation here as um, original cost is just showing us the depreciation amounts. And obviously the detail is going to show you um, the items that make up these amounts in here. So here again is the example of that item, depreciation is being tracked on it, and this is what's going on with that one. Okay, I'm gonna stop here a minute. I do see some questions here. I'm sorry, I haven't been paying attention here. Um, and uh, Larry had a good question, and thanks Amanda for um, answering those, about having the option to, for the system to run these reports in all three formats at once with maybe a page break um, between each one. And we do have plans, and I will talk about this here in a little bit, um, for a inventory fiscal year in bundle. Um, so um, Amanda's got the um, JIRA issue here. So um, that's something that um, we'll have to look into to see exactly how that's all going to be generated. But I'm assuming that it's going to generate, you know, each of the individual reports on that report bundle, summary and detail. Um, but, you know, we'll look into that a little bit further. Um, and I will talk about that fiscal year and bundle here in a little bit. Let's talk about the non-GAAP reports now. So we just got through all the GAAP reports and how to run those and what those do. And now we're going to talk about the non-GAAP. So, um, these are just recommendations um, from us. They can run all the reports that are listed under the report option in inventory if they want to um, and keep track of that. And the report bundle will include everything. And um, for now, if um, but these are the ones that um, we've recommended. This might change. Um, the asset last by grant source or asset listing by grant source is not one that we had in classic, but um, with it being just new this year, I um, thought maybe it'd be a good idea to, to put this one in here. And this is just the list of acquisition transaction data by the source code or grant identifier. So this is basically what's showing up on the acquisition screen. So um, it's just pulling in, where did this come from, this item? Um, how was it acquired? Well, it was tied to this purchase order. And that's, you know, it was brought over from the pending file or it was, or this information was added in manually when I added the item. And so this report is going to um, include all that information. And so the classic counterpart is the EIS 203. Uh, the brief asset listing is another one um, that um, has, it's the equivalent of the EIS 304 in classic. And it's a really nice report because it contains the probably more important fields of each item on one line. Um, so it's a summarized version of an asset on there. And so um, they can go in and select specific things in there, capitalized versus non-capitalized, whatever. Um, but in here, the recommended versions to generate at fiscal year end, um, are including capitalized items only and these specific status codes, which these active new excess asset held for resale and excess asset not in use are considered the active um, item statuses. So um, it'll want you to run these reports by fund and then again by function, by asset class, and then also run two other reports just for what was acquired this year and then what was disposed of. And so, like I said, it's for capitalized items only with an active status. Those are the ones that are recommended. The book value report um, displays the depreciation. So back up a minute. 
the brief asset listing is the original cost amounts. The book value is your depreciation amounts. So you can display, um, it displays um, what's going on with every item. The original cost of the item is on there just as a FYI. Um, salvage values, your life to date, obviously, your fiscal to date depreciation amounts, um, the book value, the percentage of, of the item, how much has been depreciated so far, and the last year of useful life. When is it going to be fully depreciated in 2027? Um, so that's going to show up on the book value report. Um, so the classic counterpart is the 305. And when you're running the report, the current fiscal year is to be used for the reporting date. In classic, it prompted for the month and the year. Um, and when you're running this, you would always put in the end of the year, like June, you know, when you're running it in classic. Um, so in redesign, um, it was selected to just include just the current year. So it includes the entire fiscal year. And so it prompts for that fiscal year. So you put in 2022. And it does for fiscal year end recommend four versions be generated. And here are the four. So again, capitalized assets only and those quote active statuses. And you can run the book value by function, by class and then run uh, depreciation for disposed of assets by function and class. Those are the four that are recommended. And this report bundle that I'm gonna talk about here in a little bit is going to in include all of these. Um, so, um, but yeah, I'll get to that in a little bit. We have three other reports and the audit report was always a report uh, that we recommended to be run in Classic. And we do have the audit report almost done in redesign. And it's even more detailed than the audit report in Classic. The audit report in Classic showed you changes in the transaction data. So that would have been item screen, acquisition screen, um, disposition screen and transfer transaction. The audit report in redesign is going to work very similar to the audit reports um, in USAS and payroll. It's going to include everything. So you add a new code um, underneath core, it's gonna be tracked. None of that stuff was tracked on the audit report in Classic. Um, so I wanted to, I kind of put a little uh, note here that these are all in development right now. Uh, but are scheduled to be out there um, by July is the estimated date right now. And so for the audit report, once that's out there, obviously we'll update uh, the checklist and the documentation uh, to include um, how to run it. And it's the classic counterpart is the, was the EIS 801. And we had an EPIC JIRA issue 164, which consisted of 286 and 319. The 286, um, so kind of the beginnings of the workings of the audit report were completed on version 115. And so the last part of this is 319. And they're working on it right now, and it's going to be out on the 118 release, which will be the end of June. Um, it will have, I believe, a demand and official option like the classic report did. Um, the main difference between the demand and official option in classic is that demand can be run at any time throughout the year. Um, uh, but the official, when you ran that, it created the same report of data, but it had a signature at the bottom for the treasurer to sign off on as their official audit report of the year. So we're planning on doing something similar to that to the official report in here. In classic, once you ran the official report for the year, you could not run it again for that year. You, you got an uh, empty report. Um, I'm not sure how it's going to work here in redesign. Um, so once we get that information from the developers, you know, we'll make sure that we include that in the documentation. But I believe they are gonna have both options, demand and official. So, you know, obviously if we're trying to look up something, something, you know, it doesn't seem right, we wanna run an audits report on it to see when was that 
item added and stuff like that, we'll be running the demand option um, on the audits report, you know, and you can run that whenever, as many times as you need to. I'm just not sure what the official option is going to do in uh, redesign yet. I'm assuming it's going to behave like it did in classic. Um, two other reports that are, are kind of not really new. Um, they will be new to redesign. They used to be part of the EIS close um, program in classic. There were two output files that were generated in EIS close. And one of them contained the depreciation information. And um, we could not find an existing redesign report that created um, that type of information. So we're going to, um, or that contained that kind of information. So we're going to create one. We have a depreciation posting report that's in development. And basically, this is the EISDEP.txt report in classic. So it's going to contain all of the depreciation amounts, fiscal to date, um, and I think total depreciation um, by um, capitalized and non cap. So that's something in the work. So I'm assuming it's going to be very similar to the EIS DEP. Uh, report that's generated through EIS close. So, you know, we don't have an EIS close in redesign. When you go to core fiscal years and you click on the close folder to close out the year, that's EIS close. So we weren't able, we aren't able to, to generate those reports at, you know, that prompt. So we need to make sure that you guys can run those reports beforehand. Um, and get that information. And once that's reviewed, then you can go in and close out the fiscal year. So we decided to make these part of these recommended reports that need to be run before you close out. So the depreciation port is going to be a new one and the fiscal year ending balances report. So like I said, EIS close and classic produce two output files, the EIS DEP, and this EIS closed.txt. And when we looked at that, it's basically the ending balances for capitalized um, assets. Um, so basically it's that ending balance on the, the 103 or the fixed assets, um, or change in fixed assets report. And so um, we decided though, it was a little more condensed uh, because it showed the ending balances by fund, and then by function and then by asset class all in one report. We don't have a way to do that right now in redesign. So we're gonna create a report to contain that information. So again, here is the name of the report, um, the JIRA issue tied to it. And you know both of these, the EIS DEP, which is um, JIRA issue 330 and the EIS close, which is JIRA issue 331 are estimated to be done sometime in July. So I don't, I think they had a release date on them yet. I think um, that's something that they're working on. Um, they may by now, I don't know, but um, I was told that they should be done by July. Okay, so those are the um, actual recommended reports. Now, the next step um, that we had in Classic after, you know, recommending the reports to be run was to run EIS CD. And so we need some type of equivalent in redesign. And that's where uh, we're creating, and again, in development, this fiscal year end bundle for inventory. And this is estimated to be released again in July on version 120. And so this should generate the same reports um, that were available in classic, you know, the ones that, you know, basically all the reports that you see underneath the report menu um, in inventory, it should be generating those. And so I don't know all the details um, on this one yet, but obviously once we get that information, um, this will be documented and showing you how to run it. Um, it sounds like, you know, from just what I've gathered so far, it's almost going to be like a, a job, like an audit job type of thing, 
um, like, like we just um, added to USAS and payroll, where um, when this runs, it's going to generate the necessary reports, it's going to zip them and send them via email to the user who generated the bundle. So it will, that, that user will have to have their email address populated. So again, I don't know all the specifics, but that's basically what it's going to do. And um, this bundle will be created when you close the fiscal year. So when you go to core fiscal years and you close that folder on fiscal year 22, this should be populated. Um, so our, like I said, our estimate is to try to get this out there in July. Um, the 120, I believe it might be that first or second release in July, I'm pretty sure. So 120 might be that first, um, yeah, that first Friday in July. So that's not too big of a concern because most districts aren't closing out yet. Um, so if there's some reason that this has to be delayed um, and it won't go out until later and you aren't able, so the bundle won't put them in the application under a file archive like payroll and USAS, correct, Mary, it won't. It's going to send it in an email. And the reason is, is because we are in the process of creating that document store, that archival system, um, where the USAS and payroll um, reports and now inventory are going to be housed in there. That's um, going to be available in the fall. And so um, we felt like we weren't going, you know, they, they thought we're not gonna go in and create all this stuff in inventory, this, you know, um, archived area in the application when we're gonna be doing it in the document store. So they thought that this was the best approach for this year is to email the information to you. So I'm gonna explain a little more here what else is going on with that in a little bit. Um, but yes, for now, it's they're going to, you're going, they're gonna email this information to you. Um, and if you can't wait, if you've got the auditors coming in July 15th, and this fiscal year end report bundle is not available yet, you can run the reports manually and save them. It really is quick. I've been doing it forever with thumb balancing. They go fast. Um, and so, and if they're running them already to review them, they're already there. Um, so I don't know, you know, how many are gonna have early audits, you know, but we're hoping that this is all ready by then so they don't have to worry about it. But if they can't wait, they got the auditors coming in, they can run these reports manually and save them on their computer to give to their auditors. And then after the 120 release, they will have the option of going in, reopening 22 and reclosing it to generate that bundle if they wanna you know, have a, a, the bundle of the reports all together. Um, they've already created them, that's fine, but... Um, uh, but they will have that option. Now, the document store that I was just talking about a little ago is going to be available in the fall. And um, from what I understand, it's kind of like an archival database where all of these reports, USAS payroll inventory, are going to be on that archival system, but they're from what I understand, is not going to be like a separate login for people to log into the archival system. They will be logging into the USAS payroll inventory applications to see those reports. It's somehow going to show that information in the applications um, with all of that. Um, and I think you know the reason why they're doing this document store is because the mass amount of reports that are sitting out there, USAS payroll especially. Um, that are sitting out there because of all the monthly uh, report bundles, any custom report bundles, calendar, fiscal, quarter, whatever, all of that's out there. They're kind of wanting to move all of that into this document store. Um, and that way, if you need to spin up an instance or something like that, or you know, retrieve their data, it's not going to pull all of that information in if you don't need it. If you're going in to you know, look at something, um, and you just want to view, you know, data, but you don't need the reports, it's going to make that a little bit easier as well. Um, 
So yes, yeah, so when that document store comes available, and I believe they have that scheduled for possibly October, um, at that time too, if you know you generated the reports manually because your auditors were already there, and you're like, how am I going to get that stuff into the document store? You will be able to go in and reopen 22, close it, and after that document store is in place, obviously, open 22, close it, and it will take your inventory reports and put them into the document store. So um, got different options here. It just depends on um, the district and when they want those reports. If they need it for auditors or if they're just going to wait um, and you know run them later. Um, but that's kind of where we're at with the fiscal year end bundle right now. Um, so do you guys have any questions regarding that part? Okay. So if they decide to generate the reports manually, that's great. If, um, if they decide to go ahead and close and then um, after obviously the report bundles are, are, are in place, that's great. And when they do, the report bundle will be generated and then they um, will go into core fiscal years to actually close. And so um, that close option looks just like it does in USAS and payroll, we'll close that folder and the fiscal year and report bundle will generate and it'll be emailed to whoever ran it. And then um, what it does behind the scenes is it's going to advance the EIS last fiscal year closed in core configuration by one year. So it's now going to show that 22 was the last fiscal year closed. Also, um, it's going to add a year's worth of depreciation to the life to date depreciation field. So those will be advanced. And it's going to update beginning balances for those capitalized assets for the new year. So once that's done then, um, they can create fiscal year 23, open the year, make it current, and start processing for the new year, similar to how they do it in, in payroll and USAS. So same type of situation. Um, <clears throat> this next slide is always a slide that we had in classic about EIS gap. Um, so that was the classic counterpart. And this would only be run um, for those districts that currently do not have their gap flag set in classic. So if they were going in, did a new appraisal, didn't you know, set their gap flag, had a bunch of cleanup to do, um, and they were ready to begin the new year on gap, um, an ITC could run this EIS gap. And this is just for ITC staff only. Districts will not have access to this. Um, we don't have that classic counterpart um, yet. It's in development in the redesign and it's um, JIRA issue 332. But I guess my question to you guys is, do you have any districts that you're going to need to run the gap flag for? I mean, all of your districts are migrating over. Um, they are, you know, if they've got their gap flag already in classic, they're gonna come over in redesign already with the gap flag on. So you would never run this. I just don't know how many of you have ever had to do that in classic. And I just kind of want to ask because I want to know, you know, to tell the developers, you know, we need to have this sooner rather than later. So great, I'm getting comments already. So not unless we have a district come on new with the appraisal. Um, so they might have one next year. Well, we're planning on getting this out here, you know, soon, like this summer. Um, and so <clears throat> that it is ready to go. Um, but yeah, I was just curious um, how many of you are really would even need to, to run this at this point. So if um, it's something you wanna, you know, look into, <clears throat> Same here, Mary says, okay, we had to do it once for appraisal. Yeah, it's just very rare that that happens. 
Uh, Deb's got a question here. What about the districts that are being set up via spreadsheet? This may uh, need, yes, I believe so, Deb. Um, for those that you are going to, and I know that you're waiting to do that, um, to load them in with prior year dates, right? You've got a spreadsheet that you've got a bunch of data on there, but they aren't all new um, that were added in the current year. You've got a bunch of um, dates from the prior year that you just want to load that stuff in, right? And so um, we do have a JIRA issue for that. And that is, and I know, you know, we're trying to do the migration effort right now and try to get this stuff all, you know, ready for them. So this one's been um, kind of put on the back burner. And I think that's uh, JIRA issue 315. Um, we do have that scheduled though. I'm not sure. I, yeah, I have to look at the um, schedule date on there to see when that's going to be released. Um, that might be on the 119. I don't know, Amanda, I wonder if you could check on that for me. It's INV 315, and it's the implementing the mass load with the prior year dates. They may have updated that um, to be on the 119 release, which isn't very far away. So um, that might be pretty soon here. And with that, um, uh, I think that, yeah, so double check that if you will, Amanda, for me. Um, I don't want to misspeak here on that, but I think that will um, allow that to happen and allow you to upload those. And so I believe that this part of the EIS gap, <clears throat> excuse me, will have to be ready in order for you to do that. So you can set those beginning balances because that's what this is. This is the, this, that's what it did in classic. When ITCs ran, oh, we don't have a fixed version scheduled for it yet. Sorry, see, I misspoke. Um, so 315, I know that they looked into that. I just don't know when that's um, going to be on there, Deb. I'm sorry. They may not be able to do that until later here this uh, summer. Um, so, but, you know, with this, this EIS gap would have to be probably part of that because this program basically goes out there and finds all of those items that meet that cap threshold and sets the beginning balances for the year so that you can run the gap reports at the end of the year. Um, so that's what that does. <clears throat> so yes, and Amanda said, we did discuss this at our recent meeting though. So it's on their radar. Um, so they know about the importance of that one. So for most of you, you know, that are migrating your districts over, they're either getting migrated over because they were on gap already and it's going to come over on gap or if they weren't on gap, it's gonna come over, not on gap, and that's fine. You're not gonna run the EIS gap because they don't wanna be on it. Um, and so if that's the case, um, you're basically gonna skip this step because if they're good to go, you don't need to enable the gap flight because it already is. So you're basically going to go in and start processing for the new year. And I'm gonna stop the, this just for a sec. And I just want to show the checklist. <clears throat> and the checklist obviously is available here. We have our link um, to the checklist. And basically that's what the PowerPoint covered. We went through the pre-closing steps. Um, so that was the first few slides. And then we went into all of the gap reports and the non-GAAP, and these were the recommended reports. So, and here's where I have a note here about the in-development non-GAAP reports um, that um, are recommended to run. So these are the ones that should be done here um, beginning of July or end of, somewhere in July. And then I've got the fiscal year um, step to close out the current year. <clears throat> And the actual, you know, JIRA issues tied to that with the report bundle. And then um, how to open up the new year. And then that last step. If you're going to begin on GAP, um, we've got this JIRA issue to enhance the GAP flag. Otherwise, if you're not going to be running it, you are ready to begin processing for the new year. So, and it goes through that. Really, you know, I know that. PowerPoint was a little detailed, but when you start to look at the steps, there aren't that many. So it's a pretty quick, painless process in here. 
Um, at this time, I just wanted to ask any of you if you had any questions when preparing for your migrations. Um, you know, I, I had the same slide in the classic uh, inventory when we went through classic closing and just, you know, just saying, you know, the, you know, districts haven't caught up. I, I believe everyone's like feverishly getting their districts caught up and their districts are going out there and running, you know, between the ITC and the districts, they're running the balancing programs to make sure that everything's look, looking good. You guys are looking at the pre-data extract steps. Um, but I can't stress enough um, <clears throat> the test importing and the balancing and just making sure because that's where you're gonna find the issues. Um, when you do a test import, that inventory import results file is huge. Um, because it's going to give you a lot of information in there about basically the condition of your district's current inventory data. You may see a lot of warnings and things like that. And some of those warnings are just that warnings. Um, and some of them are errors. And those errors definitely have to be corrected. So we've made a lot of um, additions to that common import. And so, and I appreciate you guys. I know you guys are reading that and looking at that and trying to figure out. And I know there's new ones that pop up. So we keep adding to it. Um, but, you know, when you do the test import, you know, when you compare it to like USAS and payroll, you really can't because inventory has a handful of reports in that post import process to balance. And it does go quick to run them. And so going in and doing a quick check of the gap reports and making sure they balance, making sure that that 304, the brief asset reports balance, if those balance, that's an indication to me that everything migrated over. Um, and it's really important too, to look at the inventory results file and specifically look at um, how many items were you know, loaded in. Um, because sometimes I know we've had situations, I'm going to go to the common import documentation, explain this. And it's mainly the items extract that's causing the issue, obviously, because that has the most information. And so um, I'm going to scroll down to that area. So this is kind of where all of the different warnings and errors could take place with the items extract. But, you know, we've got, you know, the errors saying, you know, these specific errors, some of them have to be done in classic and some of them can be done in either classic or redesign. So, you know, that's important to kind of take a look at that information and also look at an inventory results file to ensure, and I don't think I have one pulled up right now. Um, but, you know, to make sure that, you know, some of these warnings aren't going to cause any issues regarding um, balancing. And I think um, the biggest one that we've encountered so far is the whole um, wrapping issue, which is explained down in here, where the wrapping looks kind of skewed, and we've got the steps and how to fix that in classic. And that's something that has to be fixed in classic. Because unfortunately, it doesn't load all the items uh, because of the wrapping. It kind of stops because it's like, hey, I'm looking for item number three, and it's not here. It should be at the beginning of that line, and it's not. So it may stop the items import right at that time. And when it stops and items, the items from importing, you're going to get errors on the related acquisitions, transfers, dispositions, because the item never imported. The item didn't import, the acquisition record won't import because the item record's not there. So that kind of can trickle down um, into those other areas. So, you know, it's just kind of important to take a look at that inventory results file and make sure that you don't have some kind of funny errors happening. So, um, and that's why too, it's important to run the balancing reports afterwards because your import report may have looked fine but you're still not balanced. So um, there could be a, an issue with the report, the redesign report. We have seen issues in classic 
And I just closed or just posted a comment on a ticket today where if there were changes made in data tree or changes made on the item record to cause issues with dates and stuff like that, it's it may not be accounted for on the import file, um, but the balancing will catch it. So that's why, again, it's just really important to do that test import and run those reports. Like I said, it doesn't take long um, and make sure <clears throat> that everything is, is balanced. Um, because once you go back here and start looking at, you know, how to fix it, sometimes it has to be done in classic. So those test imports are pretty, pretty important. Okay. I guess the last thing I have some, you know, just PowerPoint uh, slides on, you know, resources that we have out there to help um, explain all of this information. But I think my question to you guys is, what are you feel like you're lacking in in regards to training? Um, is there something you want more training on? Do you want a training on specific common import? I mean, I know we have a documented in there, but would you like to have training on that? Or would you like another overview? Or would you like a training on reports? So if those are things where you really feel like you need more help with that, um, I'd like for you guys to, you know, post that in the chat or send me an email and just tell me this is, you know, the part that we're struggling with. Um, and I would like more training on it. And we'll get that or include it once I, you know, post the um, evaluation today, put it in, in there and tell me what future training you want. And um, we'll see what we can do to squeeze that, in, that those trainings in for you. Um, Okay, I don't see any other chat messages here. So do you guys have any questions regarding the inventory fiscal year end? Michelle, I have a question. It's not related to year end specifically, but a lot of our districts um, don't close their inventory in a timely manner in conjunction with the fiscal year. They get everything entered and balanced, and then they leave it open until after audit um, in case there's things that the auditors would recommend that they do. Is that going to be an issue if they leave the inventory open for um, several months and not close um, in conjunction with the fiscal year in July? I don't think so, Mary. Um, you know, kind of it's, that's where the flexibility comes into play. Like, it, you know, it does in, uh, in the other applications is if they leave that open and they create, you know, fiscal year 23 and they start processing in there, there sh I don't believe there should be any issues. I'll confirm that though with the um, developers to make sure. Um, and I will let you guys know if it's any different, but right now they should be able to leave that year open and create the new year and start processing in 23. We're trying to make sure that everyone has closed FY21 before we migrate them so that they're in current FY22 uh, mm -hmm. when we do the migration, which hopefully we'll be able to get started um, in the next two or three weeks um, on our first test district on that. Um, but um, we're, we're a little behind our schedule of getting started on that, but that's life. Right. And I know you're not, the, I know you're not the only one. I know it's, there's just between USAS payroll and inventory. It's a lot. So um, I know we'll all breathe a big sigh of relief at the end of this year. Uh, I think we should have a party <laughs> once everyone's migrated over. <laughs> Amen. I know that um, it's always such a good feeling uh, when we do get an email from an ITC saying, we're done, we're complete with our migrations, and you can just even feel it in their email how relieved they are. So, you know, we can't say enough. You guys are doing a, a great job and could not do this without you guys. So um, keep, keep up the good work. Keep chugging through. Hey, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Stepped in, in here. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And I want to thank Mary for asking that question because it was on my list. Um, 
But uh, the other thing that I have on my list, and this is maybe just a stupid, I don't know what I'm doing technically in my job, um, but um, we have an EIS backup procedure that we run just prior to the closing that creates an archive file. Mm -hmm. um, so this is going to, because of posting periods, we will not have to do that. Right. Exactly. Yeah, just like you don't with um, USAS and payroll either, you know, applications. So you don't have to worry about that in redesign. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Like I said, I will look into that, uh, Mary, to confirm that. Um, but I would assume that, you know, it isn't an issue not to close the year and open up the new one. Um, but I will confirm that with the developers. And if things change, I will let you guys know. Um, and we'll be able to document that as well. Um, other than that, that's all I have for you guys. And I want to thank you guys um, for being on the call. And everyone has a great weekend. Thank you.